Hello and welcome to the June 28th online worship service for West Des Moines United Methodist Church. My name is Mark Wilson and I'm really glad you took the time to join us for this worship service today. A few things I'd like to point out that are going on in the life of our church. At 11.45 today, June 28th, we are going to stand in unity with our neighbors from Imani Church. Please join us if you can with signs to participate in this very important demonstration. And then also, next Sunday, July 5th at 6 p.m., we are going to worship and fellowship and have ice cream in our parking lot. So please join us for that if you can. And also, like always, please take a look at the link for our cares, prayers, and joys and keep all of those folks and situations in your prayers this week. Thank you for joining us for this worship service. And I pray that we all feel God's presence with us during this time. I want to welcome you to worship this morning. It is so good to gather with you on Sunday mornings. We are in the middle of a sermon series called Renew Promises. And we're going to be talking about um, what God has promised to us. We're looking at the book of Acts. So glad to have you here this morning. Would you join me in a moment of prayer? Good and holy God, we welcome you into this space. You who um, have surrounded us with grace and love we pray no matter where we are today in our homes or maybe in our cars watching on our phones wherever we might be we pray that your grace might flow into all of these places that uh, that you might again discover us and welcome us into your love lord be with us in this hour in christ's name amen well welcome everyone Oh, my God. 
to take time each Sunday morning to welcome children into worship. This is um, really, I think, what God has called us to do, to make sure that children feel like they're welcome here. So welcome this morning, kids. It's good to be with you. Um, this is always one of the delights in the service to spend time um, with our children. Um, I want to just tell you this morning about something I have discovered about God. Um, in my life, there have just been times when God has sort of filled me up. And that got me thinking today, I got a bowl. Um, I found this bowl, it was made by somebody, it's kind of a pretty bowl, but, um, but my life sometimes can be sort of empty like this bowl. And then, um, then God seems to come into my life and do things. Like sometimes God sends me friends, people that I care about and that care about me and, and want, um, want my life to be better. And that kind of fills up the empty spots or sometimes God will just send me something of beauty. You know, maybe like this painting that's behind me, this is in one of our classrooms here in the church, and it's beautiful and it's colorful and, um, and it just changes how I feel. Sometimes what God fills the bowl with is hope. You know, when I think, oh, can things change? Or maybe when I'm wondering, gosh, how will the pandemic, you know, how will it change? When will it end? Then God seems to give me hope. So um, this morning, I want you to think about what God might be bringing to you. Now, I don't know if you have a bowl in front of you. Maybe some of you are just finishing breakfast and you do actually have a bowl. But if not, you can take your hands and kind of make a bowl. And this is really a way that we might pray to God by having our hands open like this and telling God sort of what's happening in our lives, where there might be emptiness or things that we're thinking about, things we need. And we can sort of present our hands to God and say, God, can you can you fill this? Can you help us? And I will just tell you, it's not news to you, but I'm older than you. And I will just tell you throughout my life, there's been a lot of times when my hands have felt kind of empty. And then when I've opened them up to God, I've discovered that something new and fresh and something I like, um, something that kind of leads me forward, fills up my hands. I think those are gifts from God. So this morning we're going to pray, and the way that we pray, I'll say a line, and then, and then wherever you are, if you'll say a line, I hope your family will all join in with you. And um, we'll talk about our empty hands and what we might want God um, to fill. So can you join me in prayer? Holy God, these are our hands, and sometimes our hands and our hearts feel empty. So this day, as we gather to worship, we pray that you might fill them up. Fill our hands with your goodness. Fill our hands and our lives with friends. Fill our hands and our hearts with your grace. Fill our hands with a sense of direction, a way to go, a way to live. We ask you all this because we know that you love us. So here are our hands, Lord. We open them up to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for being here today. Thanks for watching our worship service. Um, I think about you and I hope the days ahead are just wonderful this week ahead and you're enjoying summer. Bye-bye. week's scripture comes from Acts chapter nine, verses one through 19. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, man or woman, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple of Damascus named 
Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias? He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas to look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil has he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the other high chief priest to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We are making our way through the book of Acts in a sermon series called Renew Promises. And that's what we're doing. We're renewing the promises that God has made to us. We're looking at them again and and finding them again as a foundation. So will you pray with me? Lord, as we think about the scripture that we've just heard, as we ponder what these words mean for us, as we look at the life of Saul, um, open these words up to us wherever we might be this day, Lord. Let this scripture become more than words on a page. That Let it really work into our hearts and our lives to understand you anew and to understand ourselves. We're looking at the promises, Lord, those absolute things that you told us, that you assured us, that we have known, come to know, um, that can never be changed. So in this hour, Lord, in this time, um, open our hearts. Look kindly on this preacher and on everyone gathered here, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts, we pray that it might be acceptable to you, and we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God wants us. There are three promises in this scripture, and that is the first one. God wants us. When I read this scripture for the first time and getting ready for this sermon, that was what came to my mind. All through the book of Acts, God is gathering up people, inviting people in. Um, last week, it was the uh, Ethiopian eunuch, and Pastor Trevor preached about him. Next week, it'll be Cornelius. Throughout, there have been really thousands of people in the book of Acts that have come to know who Christ is, and they're all invited in. They're all wanted by God. God wants us. I thought about that poster that we've seen maybe from World War I, World War II. Uncle Sam wants you, you know, that poster. Well, I don't know what we think God might look like. I mean, I think for each one of us, there's a different sort of image or understanding. But somehow we can imagine God wanting you. I think that's the message here. God wants us. That alone should just be thrilling. I mean, it just should kind of shake us. In this world where we work so hard and strive so hard to make our way, where we're often sort of in a competitive business, um, where we can oftentimes try to one up one another, you know, to be the, the best at this or at that, where, where life can see, com- seem competitive. In this world where we often wonder if anybody wants us or knows us, um, if anyone sees or acknowledges us, God wants us. You are wanted. And who is it who wants us? God. Just to stop and pause on that for a moment. God, the creator of all that is. God who makes the winds blow down the rocky mountains. God who knows what's happening at the very depths of the sea. God who has roamed every human heart and knows what happens there. God who knows our thoughts, um, even maybe when they're unconscious to us. All that is hope and wisdom, 
All that is mercy and forgiveness. God, who knows all this, who knows how the world began and how it will end, knows how our lives began, knows this every day. God wants us. And God invites us into the sacredness of God. Every one of us has been invited to meet God, not just in our death, not just at the end of our lives when um, we all pray and hope that we're heaven bound, but in the day to day, God wants to share our lives and draw us up into all that's good and holy. Kind of takes my breath away to think about that. In every moment, God calling to me, wanting to be with me. We may not feel worthy of the invitation. We may think if God really knew us, God would not be inviting us to join the team. But if you're thinking that, take a look at the scripture. Take a look at Saul. FYI, Saul will eventually become Paul, but for right now, he's Saul. And he seems like the last person God would want to invite We first meet Saul a few chapters earlier in chapter 7, and he stands while Stephen is stoned to death, one of the followers of Christ, and he holds the coats of those who are doing the stoning, and he approves of what's happening. And then we meet Saul in chapter 8 when he's on a rampage. He's entering the homes of followers of Jesus Christ and hauling them off to prison or to work something worse. In the scripture for today, it begins with, Saul breathing threats and murder against the followers, the people of the way, the people who follow Jesus Christ, breathing threats as though hatred is settled right down into his breath. And with every breath, he's angry, he's bitter. Um, He wants to hurt those who are following Christ. It's really a campaign of terror. Saul is defending his faith tradition. Um, I think that's probably how he would explain it. And I think that's okay to do that. The the Jewish faith tradition is a a tradition of deep faith and goodness. It's our ancestors in the faith. But the thing is how he's going about it. He's filled with hate and anger. He not only wants to defend his faith tradition, um, but he wants to hurt other people who aren't a part of it. Um, It goes beyond defending into being on the offensive in hurting other folks. He is the enemy. He is so far removed from what God is doing in this moment that you would think he would be the last person that God would invite. And yet God does. God spotlights him. I mean, that's the way the scripture sort of describes it, this blinding light that comes over him and um, Saul falls to the ground. Um, God calls his name. And actually in the scripture, it's Jesus. But in the book of Acts, God, the creator, Jesus, the redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, the sustainer, they gang up. They gang up on humanity and draw people in. And so uh, he hears his name, Saul, Saul, and uh, down to the ground he goes, face planted, really. We can imagine him almost groveling in the road. This man who had been so arrogant and so proud, down on his face. He's blind. He's unable to walk without assistance. He has friends there who help him, and scripture tells us that for three days he doesn't eat or drink. The writer Flannery O'Connor, Southern writer, she said this of Paul's recruitment, of this invitation that Paul received. She said, I reckon the Lord knew that the only way to make a Christian out of that one was to knock him off his horse. Now he doesn't have a horse, but we get the sense of what's happened here is that he's really been really crumbled in this time. Thankfully, God's methods for invitation and recruitment differ. Some people will tell stories of times when they really um, were just really confronted by holiness, by God, by the presence, maybe by Jesus or the Holy Spirit, but a moment when they really were confronted and um, and their lives changed in an instant. For um, most people, recruitment doesn't happen that way. Um, If you think about Ananias, the other character in this story, he seems to be of a much more gentle sort. He's been living with uh, a group of Christians and apparently has become part of their community. Um, He's had a gentle entry into, um, into a life with God. 
How would you describe the invitation that you receive from God? Some of us receive, again, these instantaneous invitations, um, a moment when we're changed like Saul. But for many of us, the tradition, it, it, the invitation feels as though it's been a gradual sort of invitation. Kind of, a, I like to think of it as sort of wading deeper and deeper into faith until you discover that it is faith that floats your life. In, in my life, it was more subtle. Um, my family took me to church when I was a little kid. Um, there were times in my family and in my life when we fell away but came back. There were kind Sunday school teachers when I was a kid growing up. Um, there were pastors who taught and, um, and preached and taught in their preaching as well. Um, there were times in my life when I went on mission trips, and that's been an important part of my journey. And I've traveled with people and stood beside them and worked with them and, and had dinner with them and through conversations. Just felt a deep sense of stepping more and more um, into what God was calling me to. At some point in our lives, all of us have heard some sort of sacred whisper where God has said to us, come this way. It might have been at a time when something wasn't right in your life, something was really wrong. Um, maybe a relationship had ended, maybe a divorce or a job or, or some sort of issue, maybe an addiction had risen up to the point where you couldn't stand it anymore. And then you hear the whisper of God saying, come this way, come this way, I want you. Um, some sort of invitation. Well, so we're talking about promises today, and the first promise is God wants us. No matter who we are, no matter what we've done, no matter where we've come from, God wants us. And the second promise, God will empty us. Now that may seem like a curious promise, but but that's what happened to Saul. And I think in some ways it happens to all of us. Saul was blind for three days. Um, During that time, God emptied what was destructive in his life so he could fully live his life. He was um, so sure of himself, you know, at the beginning, this the breathing the threats and murder. He was sure that as he was breaking down the doors and he was hauling off people, that he was just certain he was doing the right thing. He was finding the right people to blame. And that's always a temptation. If we can take whatever is painful in our lives and we can blame it on somebody else, um, that's what Paul was doing, I think. I think much of what he was doing was driven by pain. He has this... Um, unhealthy ego, and God seems to drain that away. Um, It seems to replace it with sort of an emptiness. Paul discovers during this time that he really didn't know what he thought he did. He's no longer um, believing what he believed before. Um, Those enemies, they're no longer enemies. Something has changed in his life. And in those three days, his path of destruction, that that path seems to evaporate. He's not at all headed that direction when these these three days end. Maybe he even felt lighter. In my life, when I am carrying anger or bitterness, it has a weight about it. And I just wonder if when the bitterness left him, if uh, if there wasn't a, a lightness of being about him, a lighter step. For Saul, what was drained away was hatred. For others of us, what God empties from us can be all sorts of things. Hatred was what what Saul carried. But sometimes what we carry is kind of what's happened to us. We might carry shame for something that's happened to us in the past. Uh, We might carry deep disappointment. Maybe a loved one didn't behave the way that we had hoped that they would and disappointed us. We can carry disappointment for our entire lives. Maybe we carry fear or anxiety. And anxiety, there's so much of that. We can carry fear that we can't keep the world under control and that fear can overpower us. Things that are painful keep us from fully living. And I believe God empties that from us. After three days, Saul was empty. Don't overlook the gift of emptiness. You know, I talked to the kids during children's time about an empty bowl. An empty bowl makes space for something to fill it. 
After my father died, my sister and I had the task of clearing out my parents' house. Some of you may have had that task. My parents had lived in that house for some 60 years, and that was 60 years of accumulation. So uh, we went in, you know, to sort through the dishes and the bedding, to open closets and see what had been put there, um, books, tools, all of those things that are a part of our lives. And so we worked for several days um, sorting. You know, some things were thrown away. Some things we decided were treasures and members of the family took those things. And some things actually would be put out for auction. That was the way we would uh, get rid of everything that we had there. Toward the end of that experience, at one point my sister and I were standing in the dining room. And the dining room table had uh, gone to my brother's house and um, my sister and I stood there. And, and in that empty space, in that house that we had grown up in, kind of looked at each other and and really um, realized how much love we had experienced in that house, how much it was a home to us. You might not have realized that when it was filled with all the stuff that we, that we had been thinking about when we were busy with the task. But when it became empty, grace began to fill up the space. And it was a moment, um, it was a moment of healing for me anyway. Today, most of the churches across the United States are empty. You know, um, the churches have responded to this pandemic uh, by no longer worshiping in person. And that means there's empty sanctuaries and empty pews this Sunday morning. I know people are worshiping, the church has not ended. But there is an empty space that's been kind of left behind. We might want to think about that and the gift of emptiness. We might want to think about what we bring back into the church and what we might not want to bring in when we return. Sometimes there's pain and judgment. Um, things can happen in churches that um, that aren't always gracious. So we might want to think about the gift of this emptiness and, and really who we are and who God is in this time to sort of savor it a little bit and to think about what God might be saying to us. Promise number one, God wants us. Promise number two, God will empty us of anything that's destructive in our lives. Promise number three, God will fill us anew. God tells Ananias that Saul is to be a new instrument, an instrument that God will use as though God is creating a new song and something that he wants Saul to play. It's kind of amazing to think about. Saul has been the one who's been snorting and making these threats and certainly hasn't been part of any orchestra that we would really want to attribute to God. And now um, Ananias is sent to him to tell him, you're to be part of this new thing that God is doing. God is gonna fill him with a new song. We have the benefit of scripture. At that time, the scriptures that that Saul become Paul would write had not been written. But now we have those scriptures and we can look at them and we can see what kind of an instrument he became. Saul will travel throughout the Mideast and the Mediterranean and he will establish churches, not by threats, not by hatred, not by anger, but by a sense of grace that welcomes people into community and values them in the way that God has wanted Saul, he will build churches that want people to be a part of it, a place where people can breathe easy. And then he'll go on to write letters to all of these churches, um, telling them about his understanding of God. In many ways, this guy, this one who was so threatening, will become the author of so much of how we understand God. He will write beautiful things that will inspire that will seem to be the very words of God come to us. In Romans 8, Saul will write, nothing, not death, not life, or angels, or rulers, or things of present things, or things to come, not a thing, not anything, can separate us from the love of God. That's something that we can cling to. 
In 1 Corinthians, he will write about love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not insist on its own way. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. He will tell us that we are the body of Christ, you and I, so wanted by God that God will use us to create the very body of Christ, each one of us diverse, each one of us given different gifts, but each one of us having a valued part. In Philippians, he will write that we can do all things in God who strengthens us. There's power in that. Um, there's encouragement. There's hope. And in that same book of Philippians, he will um, thank God for the joy that he feels when he even thinks about the people who he have drawn together in God, um, the very people that he set out to persecute when he was on that Damascus road at the beginning of this scripture. God wants us. And God will follow us. And in some ways, God will stalk us, actually whisper to us, come to us in dreams, send loving people to share our lives with, even spotlight us if need be to get our attention. And God will empty us, help us to carry out the trash of life that just bogs us down, that keeps us in hateful thinking, that keeps us in shame, that keeps us in some sort of pain. God will empty that. And God will fill us anew with the good stuff of mercy and grace, acceptance, forgiveness, the stuff that is God and the stuff that God needs in the world. God will do this. God is doing this in this moment. This is the promise of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Uh, I'm Pastor Trevor, and I'm here to pray with you this morning. Um, I'm here in the church office, and whenever I come into this building, I think of you all. Uh, I think of you all a lot, and, and where your lives are, what you might be doing, um, the ways that you're out being the church, um, the ways that you might be needing a little extra blessing or love from God. And not only am I thinking of you here, but I also have uh, these items that I, I just want to briefly uh, mention to you that when I'm in my office, um, it actually, I, I see these items and they, they bring me back. They make me think um, and remember some important times. And so Cindy, uh, Pastor Cindy talked about how God um, seeks us out, how God empties us and how God fills us. And, um, and for me, a lot of those ways have been done um, in different experiences I've had with different groups of people. So real briefly, this brick here comes from Pleasantville Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Uh, it was a, a part of the building, the brick and mortar of this building. It's the one that burned down um, not too long ago. Uh, people in this church sought me out. That's where I went to church for the first time. Um, I'm grateful for these people. Um, and... My life has changed uh, because of them. My faith walk, I mean, I would never have been a pastor um, if it weren't for them. And that leads me also uh, to some other important people who gave me this mug. It says trouble on it. Um, it's from Emanuel United Methodist Church in Beaverdale. And uh, at Emanuel, I started there as a director of children's ministry and youth ministry. And I uh, worked out this call to become a pastor. And so I'm grateful for the folks um, who... Uh, loved me and welcomed me with open arms at Emmanuel, uh, who helped me grow and guided me into the pastorate in which I find myself in now. So ever grateful for the people at Emmanuel. Um, and then I get to my first church, Farmer's Chapel, United Methodist Church, um, where I learned what it was really to be a pastor. And I had um, some wonderfully gracious folks who walked along um, this first beginning journey with me. And so um, I keep this to remember them. And then this final piece is a piece of pottery um, that was made during um, a sermon given by Bishop Lori um, right before um, I was commissioned as a provisional elder in the United Methodist Church. And so I remember this as the ongoing call, uh, the rest of the journey, where God might be leading me now and in the future. Um, so 
I wanted to share these things with you and I wonder if uh, there's a way for you to look around and see what in your home might remind you of what God has been doing in your life. Maybe the ways God has called you, uh, maybe the ways God has emptied you um, and filled you back up. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for signs and symbols. We give you thanks for memories. We give you thanks for people, uh, your people, that remind us that you, God, are with us, that your Holy Spirit dwells among each of us, that you call us, you empty us, you fill us. This is a part of redemption. This is a part of all of our faith journeys. We give you thanks. And let's pray together the way Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Hi, I'm Perry Beeman, and thanks for coming to our online worship. You know, the online worship is a good example of how our volunteers and our staff are coming together and providing a great service during this pandemic. But that would not happen without your financial support, and, and neither would our plans to eventually return to the church in some form. Probably going to have online and in-person services, and we just wanted to take a moment to thank you for your support. We know some of you uh, can't support the church right now financially. It's been a tough time for a lot of people on the job front. But for those of you who can, and for those of you who hope to in the future, thank you. All right, this is Change My Heart, Oh God, from the Black Book. Feel free to sing along if you'd like. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. You are the potter. I am the clay. what I pray. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Thank you so much for joining us for worship this morning. Um, you are wanted by God, and God will empty out whatever sort of pain we're carrying, whatever it is that keeps us from fully living, and then God will fill us anew. This is the promise of God. Have a great week and go with this blessing. May the love of God, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and always and give you life.